uh, I don't know if it's good uh, morning to some people, good afternoon to some, and good evening to people who are in the United States like me. Uh, and thank you so much for having me and thanks for organizing this nice conference. Uh, the topic of my uh, presentation is uh, coincident object and the grounding problem. So um, I start with an introduction and, and is it possible that two material objects can be composed simultaneously of the same components? Are the statue and the lump of clay, or the ship and the collection of flies, and the body and the person, two numerically distinct objects that are spatiotemporally coincident? The grounding problem is about the puzzle of numerically distinct spatiotemporal coincident objects. Suppose lump, a lump of clay, and Goliath, a statue are created and later destroyed simultaneously. They would share all spatiotemporal properties and relation, and they would be subjects to all the same physical pushes and pulls. On the one hand, it would appear as though there is only one thing located exactly where Lumpel is, a clay statue, which exists for, the same, for some time and then goes out of existence. Metaphysicians who hold this view, uh, we call them monists in this uh, discussion, believe that even though we are using two different names, Lompel and Goliath, for as long as they exist, are entirely similar in terms of their physical and spatiotemporal structure. Therefore, for monists, Lompel is ontologically speaking identical to Goliath. On the other hand, there is a straightforward answer to the puzzle. The Lompel and the statue have different properties and relation. For instance, Lompel and Goliath seem to have different modal properties. Lompel appears to be capable of being squashed into a ball, whereas Goliath does not appear to have this capability. They also seem to belong to different sorts or kinds. The latter is a statue, while the former is a lump of clay. In addition, they seem to differ in other ways, while Goliath, for example, might be statistically valuable or immensely, uh, immensely expensive, or etc. These properties cannot be attributed to lump. Let's call set of apparent properties and relations that make Goliath distinct from Lumpel, Sortalish properties and relation. I am using uh, Karen Bennett's term here. Hence, um, such Sortalish differences are real based, uh, if, if these Sortalish differences are real based on Leib Leibniz's law, the indiscernibility of identical, uh, Lumpel and Goliath are ontologically distinct. Metaphysicians who acknowledge the uh, ontological distinction between coincident objects are called pluralists in this debate. Historically, monists have challenged pluralism by holding that the appearing, there appears to be nothing that can explain the apparent sort of differences between coincident objects. If they are physically and especially temporally identical, then the challenge for pluralists, as Monis put it, is to answer the question of what grounds sortalish differences between coincident objects. Some Monis suspect that pluralists would be able to find any plausible answer to the question at hand. Therefore, they conclude that the grounding problem is a good reason to reject pluralism as an, as an untenable approach toward the puzzle of coincident object. In this paper, I try to show that the dispute between monism and pluralism cannot be resolved by appealing to the grounding pro problem alone. I argue that grounding problem or uh, a very similar problem is a challenge for both monists and pluralists who take the existence of real mind independent composite objects seriously. 
in the second part of the paper, I um, show how a pluralist can possibly deploy the essentialist account of modality to ground the sort of differences between coincident objects. So here, I should clarify that uh, I defend neither pluralism nor monism. Rather, my paper, my uh, presentation defends a hypothetical claim. If pluralism is true, the grounding problem cannot, can, can be solved by appealing to the different essences of coincident objects, as I will explain to you. So uh, the first part, why does the grounding problem does not settle the dispute between monism and pluralism? Prima facie, one might suppose that only pluralists are obliged to deal with the grounding problem. However, it is legitimate to say that monists are also expected to explain how Lompel and Goliath are identical if they appear to be modally different. Monists are expected to, are expected to provide a compelling explanation to show why such modal differences do not metaphysically distinguish between so-called, according to monists, coincident objects. Put differently, monists owe us an explanation for why sortolish differences between coincident objects cannot be metaphysically distinguished. Apparently, there is no doubt that there are modal and other differences between Goliath and Lompel. Goliath, as I mentioned, uh, can be, uh, cannot be squashed into a ball, while there is such a possibility for, uh, such, such, a, such a thing is possible for Lompel. Lompel can be squashed into a ball. If Goliath and Lompel are identical, then the question for Monist is how a single object can have different contradictory modal profiles. To reject pluralism, monists are expected to show that the apparent modal differences between Goliath and Lompel are not ontologically differentiated. To, con to consistently accomplish this task, monists might defend a version of, uh, might appeal to a version of modal ontorealism or deflationism according to which modal pr uh, profiles of objects are not ontologically speaking real. In the following paragraphs, I rely, I rely on Alan's, uh, Alan Seidel's argument to put the success of such a project in doubt. In his paper, Modality and Object, Seidel shows why someone cannot be realist about composite objects and defend anti-realism about the modal properties of the very same objects. For the sake of brevity, I skip repeating uh, Seidel's argument here and just focus on its upshot. Those who believe in real composite objects, according to Seidel, ought to concede that their modal properties of the very same objects are real and metaphysically distinct differentiating. In other words, Realism about objects entails realism about the modal profile of the very same objects. One cannot accept the former and, the re and reject the latter and the other way around. Realist monists who believe in concrete composite objects as real and mind independent entities should take a realist uh, position regarding these um, uh, objects, day ray modal properties. This point clarifies why the grounding problem, contrary to the advertisement of some monists, cannot settle the dispute over the occurrence of coincident objects in favor of monism. Rather, both pluralism and monism face a similar challenge. On the one hand, pluralists should expect on what uh, grounds, on what grounds modal properties or relations between coincident objects differ. Monists, on the other hand, are expected to show why apparent sortolish differences or modal differences between coincident objects are not metaphysically differentiated. Thus, 
the grounding problem solely does not support monism over plurality, since proponent of both fields must deal with the same fundamental question. The question is, in virtue of which an object has its dere modal properties. Uh, so the dispute between monism and pluralism regarding the existence of, for instance, entities cannot be settled just by appealing to the grounding problem. Uh, hence, um, sorry. So maybe the reason for adopting pluralism over monism or vice versa should be coherent, should be supported from different perspective. For example, the disagreement between two uh, opposite philosophical views can be settled based upon the theory of material uh, composite objects that provide, I mean, in which theory, uh, um, it depends on the best theory. If the best theory is committed to coincident objects, then we can acknowledge the existence of, or the occurrence of uh, coincident objects. Or if the theory uh, is not um, um, committed to coincident objects, then uh, there is no any problem like coincident objects. The, the dispute cannot be solved based on the grounding problem alone. So in the first part of the paper, I tried to show that the grounding problem is a problem for both monist and pluralist. And um, now I try to uh, skip this part because it might make the, uh, my presentation long. So now let's assume, I mean, the, 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 the solution should be supported based on what theory we are committed to. Now let's assume that, assume that our best theory commits us to the existence or the occurring, occurrence of coincident objects. In the rest of the paper, I address the question of how to find a ground for the modal differences between coincident objects. How the second part of the paper, how to ground modal differences between coincident objects. To deal with the grounding problem, we need to address a more fundamental question. In which of what does an object have its dere modal profiles? In the following uh, paragraphs, are, I argue that the Aristotelian essentialist account of modality revived by uh, E.G. Law and Kitfine in the contemporary literature can address the question and pluralists can avail themselves of this theory. But first, I need to clarify what I intend by essence of an object in this account. The notion of essence, according to this view, is whatever can eventually settle the fundamental question of what a thing is. In other words, essences of, essences of entities or things in a broad sense reveal the nature and the entities of those entities or things. Essence in this view is not, in this view is the very being of the thing. All entities, all objects have essence, but their essence is not further entity related to them or in some special way. As E.G. Lowe properly argues, it is simply incoherent to suppose that essences are entities. Also, to know something's essence is not to be acquaint acquainted with some further things or a special kind. To know something's essence is just to understand what exactly the thing is. Having this Aristotelian concept of essence, essence in mind, Kitfine argues that the notion of essence is more fine-grained and fundamental than the notion of necessity. Thus, instead of analyzing essence in terms of necessity, he proposes the necessity, he proposes the idea that necessity have, has to be understood in terms of essence. Underlying the asymmetrical relation between essence and necessity, 
Fine uh, argues that the essence, uh, the essence of an object must be taken as primitive notion which grounds de re necessary profile of an object. According to Fine, uh, truth of an object can be identified with uh, the propositions that are true in virtue of the nature of objects, whatever. Based on this view, what must metaphysically be the case is restricted by the essences or the natures of entities. Put it more precisely, propositions concerning what is metaphysically necessary or what is metaphysically possible are grounded in propositions about the nature or identities of things. Based on this conception of essence, one can also provide an account of individual essence. The, in, the individual essence of an object uh, is identified with the, classes, uh, with the class of all propositions that are true in which of uh, its nature. For example, the proposition that Socrates, Socrates is essentially a man is part of the essence of Socrates, insofar as the proposition is true in virtue of the nature of Socrates, in, in contrast to essential truths which concern what is essentially the case with respect to individual objects. And also, uh, another uh, point about this view is that metaphysical necessary truths are not simply true in virtue of the nature of certain objects, but rather they are true in virtue of the nature of mm, certain objects taken together. Each object or selection of objects substantially contributes to the ability of necessary truths. And uh, one can hardly explain to determine from uh, totally uh, from the totally to totality of itself what the different contributors were. If metaphysical necessities are grounded as expl explained above, we can define uh, the metaphysically possible properties of an object as pro as properties that are compatible with the essence of the object. In other words, a property is metaphysically possible for a thing because nothing um, in its essence prevents it from possessing the property. For example, it is possible for a house uh, to be made out of wood, bricks, me metals, rocks, and so on. Also, the house can be made in other ways. The notion of the house and the nature of the house, the real definition of the house determines what is possible for the house. According to this model, uh, this model of understanding modality and other essence, uh, the differences, the metaphysical uh, properties of an object are grounded in essential, in their essential features. And one important significant aspect of this issue is that uh, it, uh, the, 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 the relation between uh, essence and the facts that are explained in terms of the essence is non-monotonic in a sense that one object can be um, the ground that can be explained in terms of many other objects in the fundamental world. Okay. This means that uh, it can be the case that X is grounded in Y and it also can be grounded in Y plus something else like Z, for example. Um, this feature allows more complex features to com contribute to the process of grounding effect. Now here, I have some issues about grounding and I skip them for the sake of the time. Now, having this model of grounding day-ray modality in the essences of things in mind, let's turn to the story of the coincident objects and their day-ray model properties that distinguish them. In our theory, um, 
if our theory, as I mentioned, commit us to the existence of coincident objects, we have distinct entities. We have two different objects and two different objects, which means that they have two different essences. Their essences are distinct. According to the model of grounding modality in terms of essence, facts about modal profiles of profiles of each coincident, uh, each of the coincident objects are expected to be grounded in facts uh, about their own distinct primitive essences. As mentioned, well, Elias, for example, does not have the possibility of being squashed into a ball, while Lumpel does have this possibility. To ground these modal features, we can appeal to the senses of Lumpel and Elias as two distinct objects with different essences. In this example, we have two modal facts. It is metaphysically possible for Lumpel to be grounded to, sorry, it is metaphysically possible for Lumpel to be squashed into a ball. So this modal profile is determined based upon the fact or the nature of the Lumpel. The nature of Lumpel as a clay statue does not prevent it from being squashed into a ball, since when it is squashed, it will still be the same lump, lump of clay, as long as the same atoms and molecules are kept or preserved. Suppose being a lime, lump is identified as a compact mass of substance in any shape and being clay is identified or is defined as a stiff and a sticky fine-grained earth. And the nature of lumpel is, is defined as a lump of clay. Since nothing in the nature of lumpel, nor nothing in the nature of clay um, can prevent, uh, uh, sorry, let me read the sentence again. Since neither the nature of lump nor the nature of clay are defined as defined above, um, there is nothing in their nature to prevent lump from being squashed into a ball. The squashed lump of the squashed lump of clay is a still lump in so far as the same material components of it is uh, the same matters, material components of it are completely preserved. Plus, the essence, if it is true, allows lump of, as a lump of clay to be in the shape of a ball. Nothing, uh, it, it, it is possible for a lump of to be in the shape of a ball. Thus, we can say that it is metaphysically possible that lump of can be squashed into a ball. And it is true in virtue of the essence of lump. In the same vein, uh, we can appeal to the essence of uh, Goliath uh, to explain its modal profile. Goliath is a clay statue. And both elements, both clay and both the essence of a statue, the essence of clay and the essence of a statue, uh, play a significant role in determining what the modal properties of Goliath are. Goliath does not have the possibility of being squashed into a ball because its essence uh, does, not, um, uh, does not provide such a possibility. It is reasonable to uh, imagine an object is a shape uh, in the shape of a, a statue uh, constituted from some kinds of elastic or flexible material which remains in shape or restored, restores, um, restores itself when the object is being squashed. So nothing in the nature of a statue prevents Goliath from being squashed. But when we consider Goliath as a clay statue, it is not possible because something in the nature of clay does not uh, uh, allow Goliath to be squashed into a ball and still remain Goliath because it would change the shape of the Goliath and the shape is very important for the nature of a clay statue. 
So the essence of GLIAS determines its modal profile and it explains why GLIAS cannot be squashed into a ball. And it is meta it's metaphysically impossible for it. Uh, so all the real profile, modal profiles of Lumpel and Glias are similarly grounded in the nature of Lumpel and Glias respectively. This is a typical example, but it illustrates how the modal profiles of coincident objects can be grounded in their primitive natures or essences. Thank you so much and so sorry for... Uh, Thank you, Atala. So are there any questions? I'm not sure how uh, my sentence has made any sense. <laughs> uh, it's pretty late here. <laughs> okay, so as I can see, there are no questions. 